The 18th century in England has been rightfully called the golden age of English satire. We'll be examining now three terms, satire, pamphlet, and mock heroic, and then we'll have a look at some of the most interesting authors of mock heroic epics. First, the satire. The satire is a type of literature that aims to ridicule folly or vice in a society, an institution, or an individual. It uses laughter as a weapon against any target considered silly, stupid, or vicious. It is also an attack ameliorated by an element of play. And the humorous definition? Satire is a sort of glass, a mirror, wherein beholders generally discover everybody's face but their own. This definition is by Jonathan Swift, himself a master of satire. And since satire can be savage and wild, here's a definition by John Dryden. Satire is a sword, but not one that causes the slovenly butchering of a man, but one that has the fineness of a stroke that separates the head from the body and leaves it standing in its place. The pamphlet. For many, the pamphlet might look like just a more intense term for satire. But actually, this is just a technical term. Originally, the pamphlet referred to short works, separately published, which were usually not bound, like in a book or brochure, but they were just loose sheets, like a leaflet, like a flyer today. There was no requirement for the pamphlet to be satirical. There, was, there were pamphlets on a variety of themes from... There were religious pamphlets, there were anti-government pamphlets, any kind of material that needed to be distributed in a less official way, a bit like on a dark web today, was distributed in a pamphlet form. In the 17th century England, uh, when you had that conflict between the Parliament and Charles I, which resulted in the suppression of the press in England, the two warring parties were engaged in what historians called the pamphlet war, consisting of uh, volleys of pamphlets written from both sides, of which the most notable participant was the poet John Milton, a defender of the revolution, a defender of divorce, a defender free press and free trade and a lot of other things. The mock heroic epic. The mock heroic epic might be arranged with a pamphlet and with a satire at the same time. It is commonly defined as a form that employs the high style associated with epic poetry in order to satirize a trivial subject. In other words, it imitates a prestigious literary form, the epic poem, which had a long history since uh, the antiquity, but it introduces contrasting elements that will explode humorously the whole subject. So on the one hand, you have the high style, and on the other, a trivial subject. There is a big contrast, a big clash between them. In the high style, you will have the invocation to the muse, typical of these poems, the parade of the epic forces, again, typical of this. And on the other hand, the trivial subject might imply humble protagonists or ridiculous situations. And all of these enter a sharp contrast that generates the comic effect. The earliest example of a mock heroic epic is Batra Mio Machia attributed to Homer, which would translate as the war between the frogs and the mice. It's a pompously narrated story of a war between frogs and mice. La Secchia Rapita, The Raped Bucket, by the Italian Alessandro Tassoni, is another classical example of a mock heroic epic. You have here a parody of the mythological rape of Europe, only that the object of the uh, kidnapping is just a bucket from a church. Tassoni satirized and at the same time ironized a popular tradition according to which a certain wooden bucket, which is kept at Modena at the cathedral, had been actually stolen by the Modenese from Bologna. John Dryden was a translator, a literary theorist, a playwright, and what interests us most here, a neoclassical poet. He's also regarded as the person who contributed the most after Shakespeare 
to the crystallizing of a literary English language. Is such a dominant figure that the Augustan age, the age of the Enlightenment, has also been called in England the age of Dryden. John Dryden might also be the reason why this age is called Augustan. Dryden's contemporaries felt that the age that they were living was a fortunate one. There were no more wars, no more revolutions, the monarchy was well established, and what is more, the science evolved and the arts flourished. In the eyes of many people, these times looked like Augustus's reign. Rome under Augustus had been prosperous and rich and at peace. So the Pax Romana, Roman peace, that Rome had under Augustus, was now echoed by a similarly prosperous time, Pax Britannica, some called it. There is a classic metaphor about Augustus. He found Rome brick, he left it marble. Samuel Johnson, the main literary critic of the time, said that by an easy metaphor, what was said about Augustus, he found it brick, he left it marble, could be said as well about John Dryden and British culture. Dryden created a new standard in translation. He translated Homer, Ovid, Boccaccio, Virgil, the Pastorals and Georgics. But he's also a, an original poet. Absalom and Achitopel is one of his most interesting poems, poem with a key which alludes at a number of political events in England by paralleling them with stories from the Bible. Macflacno is a hilarious mock heroic poem by Dryden. Here Dryden takes aim at one of his literary rivals, Thomas Shadwell, an author whom he considered to be a very, very low quality, yet of a renown that is out of proportion with his quality. Shadwell, whom he keeps calling throughout this poem sh and dots, so suggesting some scatological word. The poem runs as if it's a genuine heroic epic, but it's not. In fact, there is a huge contrast between the style of the poem, which is very pompous, heroic, full of bombastic phrases, and the ridicule of its subject, which is actually intellectual stupidity. One memorable example of mock heroic epic is The Danciad, an heroic poem in three books by Alexander Pope. Dance, you should know, in English means stupid, someone who is trying to learn something but doesn't manage. Apparently the name comes from the name of a philosopher from the Middle Ages, Dance Scotus, and because his ideas were very obscure, some equated his name, Dance, with stupidity. A dance cap was the kind of uh, grotesque, uh, conical cap that was put on the heads of the students who were considered lazy in order to humiliate and shame them in front of the class. In the dance yet, Alexander Pope writes a poem that is like an ode to stupidity. Stupidity, or dullness as he calls it, has conquered all the world. It's uh, waging a war against wit, against intelligence, and little by little it's gonna conquer the whole world. The Rape of the Lock by Alexander Pope is one of the best examples of mock heroic narrative poem. Published originally in 1712 in two parts, called Cantos, the poem was then extended to five cantos in 1714, with a final form published in 1717. Now, rape in this title 
is the old term for kidnapping. It alludes to famous kidnappings in Greek Roman mythology, like the rape of the Sabine women, like in this picture, the rape of Europa, the rape of the daughters of Leukippos, the rape of Hypodemia, or the rape of Proserpina. In Alexander Pope's text, however, the object of the kidnapping is not a person. It is just a lock. Lock not like in a locking device on a door, but a lock of hair, a strand of hair, a thread of curly hair on a girl's neck. The story behind the poem is very nice. Some friends, the Firmer family, appeal to Alexander Pope because of an incident. Their daughter, Arabella Firmer, had entered a conflict with a boy that apparently had a crush on her. And the boy had done something stupid. He took a pair of scissors and cut a lock of hair. He probably wanted to have it enclosed in a locket like lovers used to. Only this lock was stolen, not given. The farmers asked Alexander Pope if he could do something to reconcile the young people, such as write a little nice poem. And Pope obliged. He uh, started writing a poem in which the whole incident was elevated to larger and larger proportions. Arabella now turns into Belinda, a figure larger than life, someone between a coquette socialite of the period and the demigoddess from the antiquity. And here we have Belinda sitting at her toilet table preparing for the day. The poet describes her as a nymph, one of those lower-class female divinities of the ancient Greeks, who sits in front of an altar, which is her toilet table, to adore the cosmetic powers. Mind you, it's cosmetic, not cosmic, so that's a lot of irony here. In the mirror, she contemplates a heavenly image. And the inferior priestess at her altar side, trembling begins the sacred rites of pride. And she is displaying before her all the offerings of the world, unnumbered treasures. These casket India's glowing gems unlocks. That's a box with precious stones from India. And all Arabia breathes from yonder box. That must be a box full of perfumes coming from the Orient. The tortoise here and the elephant unite, transform to cones, the speckled and the white. The speckled is tortoise shell and the white is elephant ivory. They were some of the most precious materials to make decorative objects from. You may read this scene as a light satire of the frivolity of a young lady like Belinda, but also as a celebration of the power of the British Empire, which made it possible to bring together riches from jewels to perfumes to ivory from all the parts of the world and put them on the table of a young lady like this girl. In her complicated rituals of cosmetic pride, Belinda is being guarded by a whole army of deities under the rule of Ariel. These are elves and sylphs and all kind of small creatures. Each of them has a task. Brillante takes care of Belinda's earrings. Momentilla guards Belinda's watch. Crispisa guards Belinda's favorite lock. This whole cosmetic scene is treated in a more heroic manner. We have a fake religious sacrament with Belinda as a priestess worshipping a goddess which is her own reflected image. So she's a priestess of the cult of narcissism. Let's have a look now at some of the excesses of fashion in the 18th century. Fashion and hairstyles. Later on, Sylph Ariel induces Belinda a premonitory dream. 
This day, black omen threat the brightest fair that ever deserved a watchful spirit's care, some dire disaster, or by force, or slight. But what? Or where the fates have wrapped in night, whether the nymph shall break Diana's law, or some frail china receive a flow, or stain her honor, or her new brocade, forget her prayers, or miss a masquerade, or lose her heart, or necklace at a ball. This is obviously ironic. Belinda doesn't get her priorities right. For her, it's the same thing if she breaks some porcelain, or if she breaks Diana's law, which means loses her virginity, or if she loses her heart to someone, or if she loses a necklace, or if she stains her honor, or just a dress. For her, it's the same. She's so frivolous. In a later canto, Belinda is invited to a game of ombre. That was a card game, very popular at the time. Before we even realize this is just about a game, we begin to read a very dramatic scene that looks very much like that epic parade of the military forces to be engaged in a battle in the next episode, which is so typical of the epic poems of the antiquity. Behold four kings in majesty revered, with hoary whiskers and a forky beard. Did you guess what these are? These are the kings in a card game. And four fair queens whose hands sustain a flower, the expressive emblem of their softer power. And this is just the image of the queens in, in the card game. Four knaves in garb succeed, a thirsty band, caps on their heads and halberds on their hand, and party-colored troops, a shining train, draw forth to combat on the velvet plain. And it goes on and on and on, and you read it as if it's a real parade of an army. In reality, these are just the cards being shown, being decked on the table. This Obviously, we have again the same type of exaggeration that is so typical of mock heroic. A simple set of cards is being aggrandized, is being hyperbolized, as if it's a real threatening army. And then, sometime after the game, the dark premonition will be fulfilled. The young baron takes out a pair of scissors, which is called here by its Latin name forfex, and executes the rape. Here it goes. The peer now spreads the forfex wide to enclose the lock, now joins it to divide. Even then, before the fatal engine closed, a wretched Sifil too fondly interposed, fate urged the shears and cut the sylph in twine. Well, basically, one of the guardian sylphs of Belinda intervened and she was cut in half by the, the scissors, but then, of course, being magical, she, she, she is mended, the two parts are, are fixed back together. But the crime remains. The rape was committed. Everything is finished. Everything is doomed. Belinda is broken and she cries indignantly, Restore the lock! She cries, and all around, restore the lock, the vaulted roofs rebound. But then there is no answer, no fierce Othello in so loud a strain roared for the handkerchief that caused the pain. And it goes on like this, full melodrama. And then, after a lot of crying, a lot of despair, after the lock disappeared and it cannot be stuck back on the head, as a final consolation, Belinda's lock rises on the sky is taken by angels and it's placed on the sky among the other stars close to Berenice's locks and other constellations and will become a new constellation. And the poem ends in apotheosis. We are looking at the firmament and we see that the world will disappear, everything is doomed to perish, when those fair suns shall set, and set they must, all those stresses shall be laid to dust. All the other hair in history will disappear, except one. But this lock the muse shall consecrate to fame, and midst the star inscribe Belinda's name. This is the ironical apotheosis in which the poem ends. You probably want to know if the two lovers were reunited after this. No. 
it caused further scandal, it caused further disaster, and they were never to be reunited.